Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Flam, Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Transplantation Program at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. I'd like to welcome you today to the CME program entitled Investigator Insights into HCV. Today's topic will be HCV, HIV co-infection, risks and treatment options. I have the great pleasure to welcome my panelists today, Dr. Daniel Fear, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Thank you, Daniel, for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Today, the CME program is going to be divided up into three segments. First, we're going to focus on the epidemiology and natural history of HCV, HIV co-infection. The second segment will be about current treatment options. What treatment options are available now? What issues should you be aware about if you choose to treat patients with HCV, HIV co-infection? And what efficacy rate should you expect? Our third segment will be on future treatment options. You will see that we expect future treatment options to be available within the next year or so, and we will talk to you again about expected adverse events and issues regarding these therapeutic options and efficacy rates. Now we'll start with segment one, epidemiology and natural history of HCV, HIV co-infection. Daniel, uh, you have a very vast experience in caring for patients with HCV, HIV co-infection. Can you give me some insights and the listening audience some insights into the background here? What are some of the risk factors for transmission in this particular population? And then talk to me a little bit about the natural history that you see in these patients. Well, just as a general background, there are about five or so million people in the United States who think are chronically infected with hepatitis C. Not all of them have HIV infection. But due to the common routes of transmission, which is really mostly injection drug use in the 60s and 70s when the hep C and HIV infected patients both became infected, we have about a third of our HIV infected patients uh, have chronic hepatitis C. Uh, many of those have been uh, infected for many decades, and so we're seeing quite a bit of liver disease now, and I think we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, so of late, perhaps in the last 10 years, uh, since 2004, there's been a really growing understanding, an emerging epidemic of uh, a new risk group for hepatitis C infection, that is these HIV-infected men who have sex with men. And this appears to be largely sexual transmission. It's been observed uh, we, in our group in, in, in New York. Uh, we were not the first to publish this. It really came out of Northern Europe. But in Australia, in the Japanese published uh, that they're seeing sexual transmission among HIV-infected MSM. There's still a lot to be learned about exactly how that happens, but it's clearly happening as a, clearly a new risk group, and it's not involved with needles. So we have people who've been infected for a very long time, and now we have this emerging group of new infections in uh, these men who have been infected for a relatively short period of time. But we have evidence that they may have, they have a rapid onset of liver disease, and some of them may progress much faster, so we really need to keep an eye on them as well. Uh, have you instituted any counseling in the HIV population? Infectious disease physicians, physicians take care of HIV patients all the time. I presume they check for hepatitis C. If a patient doesn't have hepatitis C, and you're seeing this emerging epidemic of acute yes. hepatitis C in this population, are there any counseling uh, measures that you institute at your center? Yeah, so well, the good news is we have lots of opportunities for telling people about it. Uh, we talked a lot about syphilis and gonorrhea for many years in our patients, and we test them frequently. Um, it's really just an emerging understanding about this hepatitis C infection, and the men at risk seem to have no sense of it. We've actually honed our message so carefully that hepatitis C is now uh, transmitted just by injection drugs since the blood supply is clean that it's very difficult to change the sense of people that doctors and patients alike don't believe it so well. So it's actually been a very difficult thing to overcome. 
And uh, I've worked very hard with the public health authorities, with, we collaborated with the CDC, but getting that message out has been very difficult. So I, I actually, this is a great opportunity to, to let people know to be conscious of it. All HIV infected men who have sex with men are now considered a risk group for hepatitis C, therefore should have repeat testing, uh, not just a single testing with hep C antibody nominally. And following the liver test, this turns out to be a very, uh, uh, sensitive way of picking it up. So a, a new ALT elevation of a couple hundred should be followed up by hepatitis C testing, in my opinion, and that's quite sensitive. The advantage of picking it up quite early is it's much more treatable and the cure rate is very high. So how often do you check uh, HIV patients that aren't infected with hepatitis C uh, as routine screening? I think sexually active men who have sex with men who have HIV infection, antibody screen every year. This would be uh, part of the standard uh, for anybody who is at ongoing risk. Uh, practically speaking, if you get LFTs quarterly, you'll see the LFT increase before the antibody. Um, and people who are having a lot of sex, many providers um, screen by virus, uh, viral load, the way they do in injection drug users, for instance, and so it can get picked up very early. I assume you counsel protection with intercourse, even even aside from hepatitis C, but is that something that is thought to be helpful? Yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up. You're right, I didn't address that directly. Um, we did a case control study in New York that we published with the CDC uh, in the MMWR uh, about in July of 2011, so we can look at that for reference. Um, the main two risks in New York were um, having unprotected uh, receptive anal intercourse and actually being intoxicated with uh, crystal meth at the time of sex. Uh, so I think that while that is an association, I think that there is good enough evidence based on that where I tell my patients to please use condoms uh, when they have sex. This is not a new message, and I'm certainly not the first person to ever advocate for that, um, and we wouldn't have so much syphilis if this were happening more often. But nonetheless, I think that that's a good message. In, in Europe, there may be some other factors. The, their case control studies were slightly different, but I think that that's a, a simple, strong recommendation to, uh, to make in any case. So you've outlined already that this is an emerging epidemic. This is a group of patients, HIV patients, that are uh, acquiring acute hepatitis C now at a more frequent rate than previously. Yes. What about the epidemiology? What is known, Daniel, about uh, what happens to patients uh, natural history-wise uh, with yeah. hepatitis C when they also have HIV? Right, so there is some really classic studies uh, that have been done where, uh, in, especially starting with the pre-antiretroviral era, uh, that it was pretty, strong evidence that patients with HIV infection progressed more quickly to cirrhosis uh, than patients without HIV infection. And uh, it was a moderately faster rate. Uh, one way to look at it is medium time to cirrhosis of about 26 years if you had HIV, maybe 34 or so years if you didn't have HIV infection, plus or minus, so moderately faster. There have been a number of studies that have looked at that now since the potent combination antiretrovirals have uh, been in play, hypothesizing that perhaps the progression to AIDS uh, may have hastened that. And there isn't a, a clear message. Some of them uh, suggest that there is not a faster uh, progression with people who have controlled HIV infection, and some uh, say that it appears to be similar to the earlier observations. So I think it's not clear. But in any case, we are still looking at a maturing epidemic of people who have had hepatitis C for a very long time. Uh, in this group, and we need to be worrying about their liver disease now. Uh, I, I mean, any data on mortality increase in the HCV and HIV co-infected patients attributed to HCV, yeah. or, is there, or is there really weak data in this regard? No, that's uh, very strong data now that with uh, uh, one advantage of these potent combination antiretrovirals is, is most of our patients are no longer dying of AIDS. Um, with that, however, uh, liver disease has emerged as the number one killer. If you consider uh, cirrhosis and, and uh, liver cancer uh, together, this is uh, the number one killer, very clearly, uh, of patients with HIV infection. So it's something that, again, advancing age, time of hepatitis C, we need to be very worried about this. So new treatments that we're going to talk about couldn't come at a better time because this is really a, a critical time for our patients. So this is all the more reason that we have to identify patients in the potentially co-infected population that they have hepatitis C and be very aggressive with therapy. 
Yes, absolutely. Now, you know, there are new screening recommendations in general for hepatitis C, uh, not necessarily in the HIV population, but in the uh, other population. Uh, it is thought that many, many people are going to be, to be identified with hepatitis C, HCV, HIV co-infected and mono-infected with hepatitis C. And many people speculate that infectious disease professionals are going to be much more involved in the care of hepatitis C in general with these chronic liver disease patients than they, than they have been previously. Um, you are an infectious disease specialist. Are there any uh, are, are there any vagaries of the liver population that you try to be aware of uh, that you might not be worried about uh, in an infectious disease population otherwise? And then I can certainly add to that. Yeah, no, please. So you bring up a couple of points. I want to uh, address some fine points in what you say. It's really, really well thought of. Um, as infectious diseases people, I think we, we have a great role to play in this infectious disease that was not previously uh, in the wheelhouse, I would say, of, <laughs> of infectious diseases docs. And that with our experience, especially with HIV docs experience with um, combination retrovirals, we're particularly good at thinking about these combinations and this will play well for hepatitis C. With that though, we have to have uh, a better knowledge and thoughtfulness about the liver disease that comes with it. Uh, we have in some ways gotten very used to ignoring sort of borderline lab values in many patients. So it's their AIDS, the, our patients get ITP, their platelet counts are a little low. And one of the important things if we're gonna be taking care of more patients with more liver disease, which we already said it did in primary care, we need to start being more aware of, of their liver disease and how serious it is in two issues, not missing cirrhosis and not missing liver cancer. And I would appreciate then, you know, as, as, as a hepatologist, a transplant hepatologist, uh, to, you know, make it really clear to the infectious diseases doc what we need to look at. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad we're having this discussion because, you know, the sad thing would be if we cure hepatitis C, and fortunately it's curable, unlike HIV, uh, and then the patient dies from a complication of liver disease that was missed because then you've lost the game when it may not have been necessary. Um, there are some uh, facts about liver patients that may not be clear to people that don't take care of liver patients as frequently as a hepatologist. First of all, cirrhosis or advanced liver disease can be asymptomatic. You do not need to have uh, bilirubin elevations. You don't need to have hypoalbuminemia. You don't need to have very prominent liver enzymes, yet patients can still have cirrhosis. Uh, how we diagnose cirrhosis, by the way, uh, with uh, definitively, is mostly to get a liver biopsy. Uh, we don't do liver biopsies all the time as much as we did frequently, but if you really want to show that someone does or does not have cirrhosis, a liver biopsy would be indicated. Um, you can get non-invasive fibrosis testing measurements, which are blood tests, uh, and these measurements can give you an approximation whether or not the patients have advanced liver disease. Uh, there's a new machine that was approved in the United States in April 2013 called FibroScan. That machine is not widely available yet, but it will be, and it gives a very accurate assessment in most cases of the amount of fibrosis a patient has. The best blood test, by the way, to predict the presence of cirrhosis in a patient is unexplained thrombocytopenia. Many physicians don't really realize that. If a liver patient has thrombocytopenia and they don't have another excellent reason for it, the healthcare team should always consider the possibility of cirrhosis and get an imaging procedure and consider additional testing. So the presence of cirrhosis is very important. And if the listening audience is wondering why do we need to know if a patient's asymptomatic, it's actually for two reasons. You mentioned one of them, hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma is one of the leading causes in, in worsening incidence in the United States of malignancy now because it happens in anybody with cirrhosis, not just HCV, HIV co-infected patients. We do liver cancer screening in anyone with advanced liver disease, asymptomatic or not, they are supposed to get a liver imaging procedure every six months indefinitely. And I also wanna point out that even if a patient is cured from hepatitis C, if they have cirrhosis, they're still at increased risk for liver cancer and liver imaging should continue on. So it's important for liver cancer 
identification and screening to identify up front who has cirrhosis and who is at increased risk. Um, now, if, if the listening audience is wondering, well, doesn't anybody with hepatitis C have increased risk for liver cancer? The answer is no, they don't. Only patients with advanced liver disease, cirrhosis. And I must tell you one other nuance. If, if somebody has a liver biopsy or they have non-invasive fibrosis testing measurements, which suggest stage three fibrosis, which is bordering on cirrhosis, we often pretend that those patients have cirrhosis and still do liver cancer screening because sometimes the tests are slightly inaccurate and you don't want to presume somebody doesn't have cirrhosis because the test was slightly inaccurate. The downside for missing liver cancer is great. The patient will die. And, and I should actually also add with liver cancer, if uh, liver cancer is identified early, the surgeons can often fix the patient either by resecting the tumor or doing a liver transplant. And that's why it's important to identify liver cancer at an early asymptomatic stage. Now, the second reason uh, that you don't want to miss a patient with advanced liver disease is because of the, presence, uh, the potential presence of esophageal varices. Patients with thrombocytopenia and chronic liver disease have portal hypertension. Uh, the reason they have the thrombocytopenia is because the spleen becomes enlarged and uh, sequesters platelets. Well, one of the other manifestations of portal hypertension is esophageal varices. And Varices are asymptomatic and they can rupture. Uh, patients who have portal hypertension and cirrhosis should have an upper endoscopy to screen for varices on a periodic basis. And if varices are identified, the patient should be put on non-cardioselective beta blockers to prophylax against the variceal bleed. So if infectious disease physicians and other physicians and healthcare providers who aren't typical providers of care to chronic liver disease patients become involved now. They really have to keep in mind some of this background about cirrhosis and for the best care of the patient, not to miss liver cancer screening or screening for esophageal varices. This ends segment one where we discussed epidemiology including transmission and natural history of chronic hepatitis C in the HCV HIV co-infected patient. Next will be segment two where we will discuss current therapeutic treatment options for the HCV-HIV co-infected population.